Hello, this is Randy with Excel for Freelancers and welcome to the PTO Tracker. This incredible paid time off tracker is going to show you how you can track all your employees paid time off, including with an annual navigation, employee detail, and we're going to have PTO allowance summary. It's going to be an incredible training. I've got so much to show you. I cannot wait. So let's get started. All right, thanks so much for joining us. This paid time off tracker is going to be able to track all the paid time off. We're going to be able to have add and edit paid time off. We're going to be able to track vacations, sick, personal leave, completely customizable with days off. We're also going to be able to track holidays, and they're going to be tracked and weekends inside your paid time off tracker. For any number of employees, we'll be able to have employee detail. We can show the employees and those details. We're going to be able to select particular PTO, make those edits necessary, and then just save that and that'll be updated automatically on the schedule, either with this employee detail here or within the summary, which will show all the employees for any given year or any given month with this single click month selector and this really cool annual navigation where we can select and navigate among years. A really, really cool tool, so I can't wait to show. I've got so many features, you won't want to miss it, so go ahead and get your beverage of choice. We're going to get started. If you do like these trainings, I just ask a few things because the training's absolutely free. So is this template. All you need to do is just click the link down below, and either with your email or Facebook Messenger, we'll get that sent over right away to you. However, if you do like to support the channel, there's so many fantastic ways you can support us. One of them is with our Patreon. Patreon, we go above and beyond every single week or every other week when we go to it and we're going to be adding additional features or focusing on areas or we're going to be taking on your suggestions and we're going to be building out new trainings and new recordings based on these trainings. So whatever you idea, if you have an idea, a feature you want added, maybe you want me to focus on a specific area or maybe there's an issue you want me to fix, I'm taking care of that inside our Patreon platform. There's also PDF downloads, so if you want all the code that's inside this in a, in a really handy dandy PDF organized file, I'm including that also inside the Patreon platform, along with a host of other benefits, including special discounts, early uh, warnings for special promotions, and a whole lot more. So go ahead and join us on Patreon. All right, let's get started on this training because there's a lot to train you on. What I want to do is to be able to show you how any type of company can track their paid time off on their employees. Now, whether they have one or 1,000 employees, something like this will be able to handle it just fine, right? We can select an individual employee, as we said, and then just de detail that employee. And of course, we get a full summary, you know, how many uh, vacation or, or sick or personal leave they've had, and then how many are available, right? We can also customize that, meaning maybe we want to be able to carry, if they have not used, all of the allotted vacation or sick or personal leave the year before, maybe we want to carry that over to the next year or maybe we don't, right? So we can get that options. How many days are we going to pay them on an annual basis? We can put that in right here. We can set our own icons. We can set our own colors, fully customizable schedules. So if we decide we are going to make sick that red color and then we go ahead and update that, all we need to do is just go back and update. And we see now that sick is now in that red color, right? So if we decide we're going to change the type of it to make be a personal leave, right? We can save that. That color is going to automatically be updated. So we can single click to select any particular uh, paid time off or absence right here. We're going to, have to be able to edit and update that. If we decide we're going to increase this to nine days and make that update, it's going to automatically be reflected inside the schedule. So a lot of features on this training, right? So it's fully customizable. And I'm going to show you one is a user and a developer so that you can create your own application and of course sell them for passive income because my job here is not just to teach you Excel, but to teach you how to be successful with Excel. We also have a list of holidays. We want those holidays to be reflected in the schedule in this green. Notice the green color here is it if we decide we're going to change or increase a holiday, we can do that. So let's say we want to make a holiday on January 25th of this year. We can do just that simply by just adding that holiday right here and then just giving it a holiday name, um, off day, right? And so that automatically is going to be reflected inside the schedule right here. So you see now it's in green. So I'm going to show you how to do that conditional formatting to handle that. We have the weekdays. Notice that we have the 8th and 9th off. That's also fully customizable, right? If we decide we're going to take Mondays 
and uh, let's say Sunday's off, but we're going to work Saturdays, right? That's also going to be reflected. So you see now it has switched to the 9th and the 10th. Fully customizable. So we'll be going over all that and a whole lot more. Okay. All right. So here's what we're going to do. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cover some on-screen macros first to see how we did that. Some design concepts. We're going to also go into the conditional formatting and taking care of all the screens. Once we have that, we're going to cover this. How do we create these shapes, right? How do we create them on the schedule here on a per month basis or on a per year basis? And then also, how do we get those affiliated on the particular schedule and placed and extended based on the number of days, right? Okay, and also this really cool annual navigation so we can navigate between years and whatever the selected year is is going to show up right here. So that's kind of handy. And of course, then we're going to go into the drill down so we can drill into any specific employee. I've got this particular employee with a lot of, and then to display that and notice particularly on this schedule as well, we also have the weekends here showing in gray. We also have the holidays in green. It's a little, we could probably go with a little bit darker green, but we get the point. And then also, we're going to have this summary where we can detail the summary how many uh, available days are with vacation, or how many days available for sick are remaining that we have to use, or how many personal leave. This one's used all their personal leave up, right? We say 0 of 14. Why do we say 14? Because we're going to be collecting for the prior year, too. If we were to change that and not allow the prior year, right? So we say no, we're not allowing it. We're only allowed seven days per year. So then if we go into that, we see that it's now changed from three minus three to seven. Obviously, we've used too much, right? But we'll keep it as that we want to carry it over because that's an additional feature that I get to show you. So we that means we are allowing it to carry over, meaning if the employee has not used up all of their vacation sick or personal leave days the prior year, those unused days get carried over to the current year. So that's what this yes will do. Uh, does carryovers those unused so that and some companies offer that and some don't so it's a simple yes or no here we can add an icon we can update those icons we can clear the icons for sick personal day or whatever we can change these as we want we have a specific folder for our employee pictures notice that our employee pictures contains here in our, in our summary they contain individual employee pictures so i'm going to show you how to get those pictures and display them here that makes it for a little bit easier and also i'm going to show you how to get those icons if we want to display those icons there's a few ways to get those icons we can display them here we can store them in a certain folder and we can also display them here on side the color so we see how it's going to look inside the schedule a very handy feature all right so let's get to it because we've got a lot to cover in this training and what i want to do is i want to just go over the basics how do we save this so notice that we've got some information here employee a pto name we've got the type right the three types that we're going to call cover vacation sick or personal leave now whether the status has it been approved requested rejected or do we need to modify it that's going to be done by supervisor what is the start date and what is the days off now when we click save that information has to be saved inside a database so this is located right here and called the pto database all that is saved here we have a unique id we have the employee ID and we have the employee name. Now keep in mind that we have employee information here, employee ID, the name, and just some information and then a picture. That's mostly what you really want in this particular training. We don't have a whole lot. And of course, I got a unique list sorted alphabetically for the employees. All right, so what we do have here inside the database, we also have the name, the type. So everything here is associated with their end date. And then I have the work days, and we're going to be going over exactly that. Now, if we have nine days off, but those nine days carry across a particular weekend, we may not have all of those as work days, right? So we're, may we have a holiday in there, right? So if we've got a holiday and two weekends, right? Let's say one holiday and two weekends, that's five days that are automatically going to be off and not paid right because it's a weekend so we're going to only use maybe four work days we need to know the total working days in that and as you see this the start date is 115 and it's going to go to 123 january 23rd 2020 and we see there's probably two weekends and a holiday inside that period so let's take a look inside the pto tracker here and we see here we have the 15th right all the way to the 23rd we have one what two weekends one here one here and we have one holiday, right? So that means we have a total of four working days inside that. So it's only those four working days that are going to get deducted on that paid time off. So that's very important to calculate, right? Because we certainly don't want to deduct from an employee's paid time off when it consists over a weekend or over a company holiday. OK, 
Okay. All right. So we're going to use that. We'll use a formula for that and I'll show you how that works. All right. So we're going to go over this. Let's just go over the main macros. That's going to how we get new options, how we clear this, how we load it by selecting it, and how we save or update it or delete it. Okay. All right. So let's get into that. Now we're going to go to the VBA. That'll come from the Developers tab, Visual Basic, or you can use Alt F11 as a shortcut to get you there. And we've got several modules here. The first one is the PTO macros. And I'll remove this module one that was just for testing purposes. We don't need that, so we can remove that. And also what I have here, the PTO, so we've got some, just some basic uh, variables here called PTO column and the PTO row. The add new is very, very simple. When we add a new one, all we're gonna be doing is clearing out some associated cells. Now we do have some hidden columns and I'm gonna go over that with you as we need them, right? And they're gonna be located in columns A and B. So if I right click and I unhide those, we see we've got some information. I wanna know that selected year. I wanna know that selected month number. So if I click February, it's gonna say two, right? If I change the year, let me update this here. I'm just gonna move this out because this particular one I'm gonna use for both the particular employee detail and the summary so i don't want this moving that's why it didn't move which is we don't want that okay but of course when it stays hidden it's not going to move so i also want to know the selected year when i click here this is going to change to 2021 and back to 2022 so b1 is always going to be that selected year b2 is always going to be the selected month whichever month we've selected I also want to know the PTO ID. Now, this particular ID is based on the personal pay time off ID. So if I select here, that ID is going to change. Remember, we have a specific ID, a unique ID for every PTO, and that is going to be located directly inside B3. When I click on it, the PTO that's tied to that is going to be loaded, and that ID is going to be located into B3. And I also want to know what row is associated with that. I've got a named range for PTO ID. We go into the formulas and the name manager. I'm going to bring this up for you. And we see we have something called PTO ID. If I tab over that, we're going to use an offset formula. And we're going to show all that. So as it grows, it's going to go. So PTO ID. So what I want to know is I want to know what row is associated with PTO ID 12, right? Now we're starting our first one in row four. So if it's found, we need to, to add on. So if I want to know which row our 12 one is located in row 15. We're going to use the match for that. We're going to match what's in B3. We're going to match it based on that dynamic named range that I just showed you called PTO ID. We want an exact match. We're adding three because we're looking for the row. And we want to make sure that we're starting it on row four. So we want to add three because I want to know that the PTO ID number 12 is located on row 15. So we look here, we see PTO ID is located on row 15. That's important because whether I'm saving it, I need to know what row to save it on. Now also keep track of the order. Now PTO employee ID. Now from here, we got employee, PTO name, type, all the way to end date. And so that is the same exact order that I have here. Employee, PTO name, type, status, end date, and all the way to days off, okay? So that is gonna be help it because it's one, it's certainly in the same column here and there we don't skip any rows so it's going to be very easy to save it because it's in the same order all the way from employee name to days off here all the way from employee name to days off right here and the end date is going to be calculated automatically because it's simply the start date plus the end dates minus one so that's going to be very very easy to calculate all right so continuing on with the macro so all we want to do is clear out when i click new absence i want to make sure that we're clearing out b3 that selected PT, pto id is going to be cleared out and of course i want to clear out all the cells from E3 through E8. And we can do that with this line of code right here. That's it, that's all we need to do, very simple. Now when we're saving it, that's the macro that's gonna run when we click this button. Whether we're saving it or adding a new one, we wanna make sure that when we save it, we're clicking this. Whether we're, and if we add a new one, it's the same thing. So to do that, what we're gonna be doing is I wanna make sure that we have all the required fields. Now those are all required, right? Those PTA feeling, all these things are required. I need to know the days off, the start date, Status is very important because if it's not approved, it's not going to be counted. It's only going to be counted once it gets to approved. Very important. I need to know the type. That's very important because I need to know. And it's got a required name and, of course, employee. So every single one of these fields are required, and there's six of them. So the best way to do that inside VBA is simply to check to make sure they're all filled out but we don't want to add if this is filled out if it's blank if blank right it's a lot easier to what we can use is the count a formula and that's just what i've done here inside b8 so count a is going to do that it's going to count all those cells that contain text 
And if for some reason this is anything less than six, it's gonna let us know. So if I try to add a new absence and it's zero and I just add one single field, instead of six, it's only one. If I try to save that, we're gonna get a message box that says, please make sure to fill in all fields before saving this absence. So it's very important that we have all those. And so what we wanna do is we wanna check B8 to make sure that that happens. And we can do that right here. If B8 is anything less than six, let the user know through a message box that those fields are required. We're gonna exit the sub. We cannot move on unless all the fields have been required. I also wanna make sure that we have a correct start date, right? E7 must be a date. I wanna make sure that it is a date. This is important, so E7 needs to be a date. We can check to see if it is a date inside VBA using the isDate function, right? If it's false, meaning it is not a date, we're gonna tell the user to please make sure the start date is entered as a date, right? Make sure it's a date and not anything else. I also wanna make sure that the number of days are numeric. I wanna make sure now we can do half days or quarter days, that's fine, but it certainly should be numeric. And that's gonna be an E8. We wanna make sure that is up because if it's not, it's gonna create an issue. We can't calculate the last day. So to do that, we're gonna use the is numeric command, right? And it is numeric on E8, if that is false, then we know that we need to let the user know to please make sure the days off contain a number, okay? So now we've checked it. Okay, so I've checked everything to make sure that all the correct fields have been entered by the user before we continue to save it. And next up, I need to determine whether this PTO has been previously saved or not. And the best way to do that is to simply check to see if there's a row associated with that right if this particular row here inside b4 is nothing then we know it has not for example a new absence we see b4 it contains empty and that's because there's a match there's an error because there's no match there's no particular id so that would return an empty space and that is because it is new so it, we can determine that using b4 so we know if b4 is blank it is a new one so there we go. This would be a brand new PTO. So we'll just put that down here, new PTO. And for new PTOs, the first thing we want to do is determine what is the row inside that PTO database, the first available row plus one, that's going to be the available row. Then what we want to do is we want to take that PTO ID, that next PTO ID. How do we know the next? We're going to use the max formula. We've used this often if you've seen my trainings. Since our PTOs are all numeric values, we can use the max and then we can add one. So this is going to give us the maximum number plus one is going to be the next available unique ID. And if there's an error, we're going to just put it one. There would be an error if there was no data at all. So we want that to default to one. Okay, so this is going to take this particular next ID. We're going to place that directly in B3. And then I'm also going to place it directly in column A here. So we're going to do that two with the next two lines of code. So B3 is gonna take on that next PTO ID. And we're also gonna place that same ID inside column A. Then what I want to do is I want to take copy J2. Well, what's in J2? Let's take a look and say, J2 is our work day, our work day. I want to calculate the number of work days, as we said. So all I'm gonna do is gonna put a formula here. Now that I got the start date and the day and the end day, I can do that. So how are we going to do that? Well, the first thing what we want to do is anytime we use the workday function, we need a mask and we have to mask we're gonna use this masking here. And basically this is a string variable and it's something that I created right here. So this particular string variable is going to be recognized as a weekends and holidays, weekends here. So zero would be working days, one would be weekdays, right? So that's how that works, right? So if I work Saturday, that's gonna to go to zero, right? So if I have, again, six zeros and one, I wanna put that inside this mask. This mask will recognize exactly what days are work days and what days are weekends. Okay, so we can use this mask, and I've given this a name variable called weekend mask. So this is the named range called weekend mask. I can use this in a formula, it's all I have to do. And to do this, of course, all I have to do is just simply create this concatenate here, combining all of those. And using these zeros is just a simple theory. If C8 equals empty, right, does equals empty, we're gonna use one because we want ones to designate days off and zero meaning work days, right? So that we have all of our work days and zeros and one. So we're gonna use a concatenate. So this is gonna combine everything here into one single string. We can then create a name range called the weekend mask. And we can use that directly in our formula right here. So we have that formula here. So what we're gonna do is uh, use the network networking days because I want to know international and we're going to use that start date. What is that start date? That's going to of course come from whatever is located in column G 
Then I want to know the end date. What's that end date? That's going to come from column I. Okay, so I is going to create that. And then we have that weekend mask, that same mask that I just used, the zeros and ones. Then we have the holidays. Now the holidays is a dynamic named range created right here. So this is a dynamic. If we go into the formulas, and the name manager, and we go into holidays, we see using the offset, we've created a dynamic named range. And that way, if there's a holiday contained within those dates, it's automatically going to be excluded, and that's ex exactly what we want. We only want to count the number of work days inside that. Very, very great formula here called Net Work Days International, okay? So this is going to exclude all the weekends, this is going to exclude all the holidays, and it's simply going to count the number of work days between this date, this start date, and this date. So when I bring down this formula, it is automatically going to be calculated here. So that's how we're going to use that very, very cool function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy that and I'm going to paste that formula in whatever row it is. Okay. And I only need to do that for brand new transactions, excuse me, new PTOs. And that is because we don't need to recreate that formula each time, right? So this is all for only brand new ones. If it is an existing PTO, all we need to do is extract the row from before. Everything else is going to be we're going to be doing regardless if it is a brand new one or an existing PTO. What I want to do is I want to take the employee ID. That employee ID is located in B9. We go here, particularly inside B9, we have the employee ID. When I change the employee ID, that is automatically going to be updated here and we'll do the, that's a change event. So I'll show you how that works right now why we're on it right so we can go step by step and that's going to be a change located right here in b3 so if i go in to our peach tracker database and i make a change a worksheet change we're making a specific change to e3 and i certainly want to make sure that e3 is not empty what i want to do is i want to extract that employee id and i want to put that employee id inside b9 if there's an error of course i want it i don't want to trap it so we're going to have on air resume next and let's just put on air go to zero o n n okay o n zero okay so that's on air go to zero so what do i want to do i want to get that employee id well where is that employee id located it's located in the employee sheet it's located in column a of the employee sheet if we take a look inside the employee sheet we see the employee id is located right here in column a so i want to pull that employee id and i want to place it directly inside b9 that employee id here all I need to do is determine the row of that. So how am I going to know the row? Well, I've got a name range called employee name, right, on the employee sheet. And I'm going to find something. What I'm finding, I'm finding that employee's name, that target value, whatever the user just changed. And I'm going to look for it directly inside this named range here. And I'm going to look in the values, and I'm going to look in the whole, and I want to extract the row number. I want it, because Why do I want the row number? Because the row number, if this gets the row number, the row number along with A, A and the row number, is going to get us our employee ID. And that's the value, right? So here's going to extract a row right here. Here's going to combine with A. That'll give us exactly the employee ID. And we're going to place that employee ID in B9. So that's all we have to do in that. And that automatically sets it up. So once we have that employee ID in B9, I'm going to place that directly inside column B of our PTO database, right? So that's very important because names can change, but IDs will not change. So I want to take that employee ID, I want to put it directly inside column B. That is going to come directly from here, B9. So it's going to come directly here. Okay, the rest is very simple. And why is that? Because we we've, we've, uh, just need to loop through this from 3 all the way to 8, 3 to 8, taking whatever values are in here in column E and placing them directly right here inside columns 3 through 8. So notice 3 through 8, we're doing the same thing. 3 through 8 rows. So we just have to do that. So we can do that through a very, very simple loop. For the PTO column equals 3 to 8. So the database is where we're going to place it. We're placing it in that row that we've already set up either here or here, right? Either one of it's new. The column is going to be 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, or 8. Then we're going to simply extract that information from E and the PTO column. Notice that this is a row though. E3, E4, E5, these are rows, but they work the same because the rows and the columns are actually the same, right? Remember that. The column 3 to 8 
is the same thing as the row 3 to 8. So we've done that quite easily there. All right, so it's relatively simple that. So all we need to do. And the last thing is I want to set the end date with a formula. Now I'm doing this end date. I could do it with a formula, but I want to make sure that we're automatically, we could easily do it with a formula, but I've decided to just do it automatically each and every time. And that means I and the row is simply equal to E7, which is the start date, plus E8, which is the number of days, minus 1. So inside here, we're simply saying the start date, E7, plus the number of days, it, minus 1, is the total number of days. And of course, this is going to extract for us our total days, right? Total days and not including the work days, right? This is not the work days. It's just going to get us what's in H, and that's exactly what we want inside I and the PTO row, excuse me, I, I here. That's going to extract our end date, right? So that's what I want. I simply want to add in number of days to extract our end date. That's going to get us our end date. Once we have that end date, all we need to do is just refresh the summary, right? Now, I want to know the refresh the summary. If, of course, if we're on this particular, this is our summary, so I know when I save this, it's going to refresh this. However, if, I, if I'm inside our employee detail and I want to add it and I've selected something and I want to make that change, I know that is this macro that I'm going to update. So if I update this to seven days and click save, it is the macro that's our employee detail that we're going to be particularly refreshing. So that's how we, we need to differentiate. Just like we did before, we need to know which macro to run, whether it's the summary or the employee detail. We're going to base it on this group to see whether it's visible or not. Okay, and then next up, we want to save message. And this is simply just to save. When I save this, you see this little fade out message is going to fade out. And that's relatively simple. We just have to change the transparency through a loop. Okay, loading it is relatively simple, right? Because loading it, all I need to do is extract whether what, whatever screen we're on. All I need to do is extract that ID number, and I'm going to place it directly inside B3 is where that ID is located. Now, regardless of whether we are on this detail or whether we're back inside, notice that the row heights change, or whether we are back in there, it's the same ID. So to extract that ID, I'm going to extract it directly from this shape. We know the shape. We see the shape is PTO item 12, and this is PTO item 3. 3 is the ID number. So I'm going to remove, to do that, I'm going to remove these. And I'm going to place that directly inside B3, right? So all I need to do is remove the first seven characters. Now, if they click on the icon, it's the same thing. The icon, PTO icon 12. Notice the first seven characters are, if I remove that, it's going to leave us with that ID. And we place that ID directly inside B3. And our row is going to be taken using the match Based on that, so we know if B4 is empty, we do not have a correct uh, ID, or maybe it's blank. So that's the first thing what we want to check. If B4 is empty, then we know we don't have a correct PTI item to edit. But once we do, we're going to put that variable right here from B4 into that variable. And what I want to do is then add that employee ID in. Now the employee ID is simply going to come from column B of our database. And we're going to place it directly into B9. Now we can simply reverse the data mapping. This time also from 3 to 8, but this time it's going to come directly from our database in the PTO row or the PTO column. And then what we're going to do is we're going to place it in E in the PTO column. So this time it's coming from our database, from columns 3 to 8, and we're placing it directly inside rows 3 to 8. So it's just the reverse. And that's it, it for load. That's all we have to do to load it. And that means when we select them, I'll go over the macro. And that's the select, and it's going to load that. And that's regardless of the type of screen that we're on, whether we're in the detail or whether we're in the summary it is going to be the exact same thing. Great. So now that we went over that, the last thing that we have in this particular module is the PTO delete. If I create a brand new one, right, and then we decide we can easily delete that. So I'm going to put give it a name, test name, and we can give it a, a sick and we give it a status of approved. And we do a start date, let's say January 3rd. So we'll do one, three, and then give it five days. And then we say that we can see that it's immediately available here directly on it. So if I want to delete that, I want to be able to delete it automatically. Now there's two scenarios whether we delete it. If I've created a new absence and I have yet to save it, right, we can skip the adding row. If I click delete, I want to make sure that if we click yes, right, everything just gets cleared out. So basically what I need to do is I need to know if it's already been previously saved. B4 is going to tell us if it's been previously saved or not. So we're going to get that user confirmation using the message box. And if they say no, we're going to exit the sub because they don't want to continue. 
But I want to check B4. B4, if it's empty, then we can skip. It has not been saved yet. We can skip to right down here. However, if it has been saved and there is a value inside B4, I'm going to take that row and I'm going to put that directly in this variable called PTO row. And then I'm simply going to delete that row from the database. Okay, with add new, we're simply going to just run the macro to add new, and that's going to clear out all the fields. And then all I need to know is determine which macro to run, whether it's the summary or the detail, and that macro is going to be refreshing. So that's it. That's all we have to do for the PTO. So we went over how to add a new one, how to save an existing one, how to load it, and how to delete it. And that's, of course, regardless of which screen we're on. Okay, great. So we covered that. Now I'd like to also cover some of the conditional formatting here. Notice we have several conditional formatting based on the weekends or based on the holiday. Okay, and to do that, what we want to do is we want to understand the weekdays, right? So our dates are in here. So if I take a look at this here, this field here, we see that this is actually a date. Now we formatted that. I only want to show the number, but it is actually a date using the date based on the selected year. That selected year is a named range in B1. Also based on the selected month. That selected month is a named range based on B2. And of course, one. And that means, so that means whatever we select here, all I need to do is just take that value here and place it directly inside B2. So if I select the month third, it's going to take that value and it's going to place it directly in three. So all I need to do inside that macro is just remove the word month because the name of the shape we're using, the name of the shape is all we need to do. And it's going to extract that. I'll go over that macro with you in just a moment. But basically, that's all we're doing is just taking the name of the shape, we're removing the word month, it's going to leave us that month number. And I'm placing that month directly inside B2 here. Okay, great, so we have that. So now what I want to do is I want to understand that this is a date, right? So it's the date based on the year, and then all we're just gonna do is simply adding one until we get to the end of the last few days. And in the last few days, especially for the month of February, what I want to do is I want to make sure that it actually contains a day, right? I want to check if 28 plus one is not the same month number, then I want to do it blank. And that's all we're going to do to check. If the month number of AG3 plus one doesn't equal the same month number, that means it's in a different month, then we're going to show blank. Otherwise, we're going to increment it one. So I can use the same formula throughout and just to make sure. So these are in dates. So the important thing is to understand is these are dates. Now, if we know those are dates, what I want to do is I want to determine the weekday. What is the weekday of this day? What is the weekday of this day? This is a Sunday. Right? So if I do equals, right, weekday here, and I want to check the serial number of this. And I also want to look now, our dates on our admin start on Monday. So I'm going to use two, right? So that I know that once we add that in, we see that that is seven, right? So we know that Sunday is seven, and that's exactly what I want. Sunday being the last day because our day is on Sunday. So what do I want to do? I want to determine is Sunday a work day or not and color it accordingly. Well, how are we going to know if it's a work day or not? Well, we can use the indirect function. Basically, what I want to do is I want to look up here. I want to look in C and the column, whether it's C8, 9, 10, all the way through 14, and see if it's been checked or not. So how do we know that? Well, let's use the indirect on this. Okay, so if we to look in here, we know that it's 7, right? So what I want to do is I want to look at here. We know it's Sunday. So how do we take relate 7? If I know it's in column C and I know our first one starts on 8 and I want to go all the way to Sunday, I just simply need to add 7. If I know that Sunday is 7 and I'm adding another 7, that's going to get to 14. That's exactly what I want. C14 is what I want to check. So if I use this 7 along with the indirect, so we'll do equals indirect and then indirect. Once we add an indirect what? Well, we're going to base it on the admin sheet. So we'll do quotes. And then we'll do the comment here, admin here, then another apostrophe. And then what we'll do is the exclamation here. And then what I want to do is I want to do, we know it's C, right? So we'll do C. And what else is it? And we know it's the weekday, right? Whichever it is, plus seven. We want to add seven in there, plus seven, okay? Close parentheses. Okay, so what that's going to do? Oh, we also have to do the. Um, that's what we want. I want to make sure. Just to make sure, we're going to do a one style. So that's important. Okay. All right. So it's the same result. So it's zero, right? So that's what I want. So zero is fine. But what if I check it, right? That should go to whatever's there. So that's that umlet, right? Which is basically the same thing. It's just this wingdings font, right? It's the same check mark. So if I change this to wingdings, we see, of course, that's the check mark. So that's what I want. So I know that if I check, we can use this. If it's empty, if the indirect is empty, we know it's not a workday, right? It's not a workday if it's empty. If it's 
check mark, it is empty. So we're going to use this inside the conditional formatting just like that. So if we take a look inside the conditional formatting here, I'm just going to highlight those here, and we'll take a look inside this, and we're going to go to Home, Conditional Formatting, and Manage those rules. We're going to use that, this, this one right here. So again, I'm going to edit this. And I also want to make sure that it is not blank. I want to make sure that H contains a value, right? Because it's going to apply all the way. There has to be an employee there. I don't want it to extend beyond that. So I'm going to check the first thing. It's going to be two conditions, right? If I to color it gray is two conditions. The first condition is column H, which is absolute, and four, which is relative, meaning every row based on that is not equal empty. Certainly there must be an employee in column H. The second condition, again, we're using that same indirect here, this the weekdays but we're basing it on a specific date and where's that date located it's located in row three right but then again the column is relative right we don't know what date so the row has the dollar sign right the three but the i doesn't because it's relative for every column between i and am again we're adding seven because i want to look to see if it's if it's equal to blank then we know it is an off day right a non-work day so we're going to give it that format which is that gray color just a light gray color we can maybe call it a little darker if we wanted to so we can see it's a little more obvious here so then when we do that right and click ok it's automatically and just click apply it's automatically going to color those darker right it's, it's not as pretty, is it, right? That color here, let's go with the lighter one. Okay, but you can see how it works. So basically, we're using that indirect inside the formula, and we're using the and sign, okay? So that is going to let us know which days are weekends just by applying that, okay? How about the holidays? Now, holidays, we have a named range called holidays inside the admin screen. It's an offset named range using the holidays. And we can do that same type of rule, but a little bit different, right? This time, we also, again, for holidays, we want to make sure that H4 and any row, H column H, and any row associated with that doesn't equal empty. Certainly, we want to make sure that there's an employee associated in that row. Next, what I want to do is I want to check I, again, I and any column I through AM and uh, any column associated in row three, checking the date, it's relative. And what I want to do is I'm going to use the match, right? If it's found, there's going to be no error, right? If we're using a match, we're looking at the dates, any date in this month, we're going to use a match and we're going to see, does this date contained inside the uh, name range holidays. If it's found, of course, it would not be an error, right? If it's found, because it's found. So if the error is false, that means this is true and this is true. So in both of those cases, I want to color it green. And that's all we have to do to give a Get that green color very very relatively simple on that great so that's all we need to do and of course I've got some alternating row here I want to color those employees notice there's a light blue alternating row I want to color those the odd rows are going to be white while the even rows are going to be that little bit light excuse me it looks like blue yeah blue light, light blue on the even rows just a very very slight color so we get those alternating rows okay so that's exactly how so that's very very easy all we need to do is just uncheck this and you see how the conditional formatting updates automatically highlighting those weekends okay and it's almost the same with our employee details so when i click on the employee detail here and click in here we've got something a little bit similar but in our employee detail right i have the entire days of the month here notice we're starting out this particular one we're basing it on the year which is located inside here b1 right we want to know that year of course i could actually use selected year i don't need to use i do have a named range called selected year so we're going to use that right that would be fine either one is fine and so what i want to do is i want to know the row minus two well, what does that mean here the row minus two look this is row three what do i want here a minus two is going to give us one that's going to give us the first day right the first day so if I know that and I bring this all the way down February is gonna be two March is gonna be three so that month number here is based on the row number right if I want January and I'm on row three how do I get to that January how do I get one I just subtract two so that way it's easy a single formula I can bring it down it's gonna get us the first day of the month automatically all I need is just bring down that formula it's gonna get us the first day of the month so how do I do that now again just like we did before all we need to do is just add one and when we get towards the end again we need to check to see if the previous month is equal to the full month and if it is all we need to do is show the date if it if it is the same month if it's a different month then we're going to show blank so that February is showing blank and that's how all you have to do and of course it's all premised on this selected year starting with that selected year so each one of these actually includes a date right so we've got a date again so we're going to use a very similar but this time it's relative based on the first cell what I mean is we're both the columns 
and the rows are relative, meaning there's dates in there, so we don't need any dollar sign. Previously, we had all of our dates located in row three, so it's slightly different, right? But in this case, they're relative based on the cell. So the conditional formatting is a little bit different. So when we go into the home and conditional formatting and the manage rules, we see the relatively the same, except there's a slight difference. This time, keep in mind that it starts in AT3. Notice there's no dollar signs, there's no absolute, it's relative both in the column and the row. And we're using an is area. Here is this is the holidays, we're matching it, but notice again. No dollar signs, it's relative based on the holidays. So as long as our applies to, our applies to must also start with AT3. Notice that our applies to also starts with AT3. That's very important. Then it's going to cover every single date in the range that we have set. And it's exactly the same for here, our edit rule. Of course, we want to make sure that AT3, AT3 contains a value. It's not, it doesn't blank, right? We want to make sure. And we also want to make sure that this one's the weekday. So again, we're using exactly the same weekday function. The only difference is the, the cell that contains the date is relative both in the column and the row. Okay, so that's it for the conditional format. That's how we can easily apply holidays and we can apply weekdays even as we change them inside the admin screen here. Okay, great. So we've covered the conditional formatting. Let's go back and let's cover this work. Let's go ahead and cover some of the features on the sheet. So we've got some sheet. Notice when we select a month, we've got some macros that are going to automatically work. And we've got the to build the employees. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of those macros. Now we can find those macros here called PTO sheet macros. The first thing what I want to do is I want to uh, show a employee detail view, PTO sheet my that detail view, I want to show all those employees. As you see, there's a there's two particular macros. There's a summary view and a detail view. This, this is the summary view here where we're showing all the employees. And this is the detail view. When I select on a specific employee and I supply here, then we have the detail view because it's showing the detail of a single employee for that. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, of course, just with the macro, let's go ahead and go inside that. And of course, it's the macro that's tied to this. This particular icon here, a macro called View Employee Detail, and those are the macros. The other macro is the one based on this backspace. So let's go into the Assign Macro, and you can see this called Employee Detail View, Employee Detail View. If we go ahead and select that, the other particular macro that we have here is on the back one, right? So this back is going to show that summary view. Here, go into the assign macros, and we see that that's the summary view. So when we edit that, we can see both macros here inside this module. We'll start out with the employee detail view. First thing I'm going to do is turn off application screen updating. I want to remove all of the shapes in there, right? So we've got a lot of shapes. I want to make sure they're all removed. I want to start from scratch. So I want to remove all any of these icons, any of these PTO shapes, basically removing all of them. So to do that, we can just run a loop. We've defined the month shape and the PTO shape as shapes. So we're going to go through all the PTO shapes. Basically, if these shapes contain certain words, employee picture, icon, or PTO item, I want them removed. Well, which ones? Here's the one that's contained. P if we take a look at the name of this called PTO icon 13. If we take a look at the name of this, it's called PTO item 13. And also inside this, we have this particular refresh, employee pick two, employee pick one, and so on and so forth. So we have those. I want to remove all the shapes. So we can do it through this loop for each PTO shape in shape. So basically, we're looking through all the shapes in the, in the sheet. And we're going to wrap it in on air, resume next, and on air go to zero. If a particular shape contains the words employee picture, meaning it's above zero, using the in string command, we're going to look for that inside the name. If it's greater than zero, that means it's found. We're simply going to delete the shape. I'm going to do the exact same thing if it contains the word icon. We're going to delete it. If it contains the string PTO item, we're going to delete it. So this is going to delete all the shapes and start from scratch. Make sure that your other shapes that you do want to keep, right? These buttons don't contain the names, right? They're very different. Making sure that they're not the same so that they don't get deleted. What I want to do is, right, we're loading in the employee detail view. So first thing what I want to do is hide this particular group shape. It's called PTO summary group, right? We're not using this for our details, so I want this hidden. So to do that, we can just do PTO summary group visible equals 
false, right? That's going to hide the summary group. The employee detail group, that's the one on the detail. Certainly, I want to hide that. That's the group of shapes that are associated with the detail. It is these shapes right here, these summaries, and that's called employee detail group. So that I want visible. So we're going to make sure that that is visible. And also the view employee button. Remember, we have that small little icon right here in our summary group. This small icon also has a name, and that is called view employee button. I also want this hidden. I don't want that showing up. So we're going to hide that as well. And I also want to set the row heights. Now remember, there's a different row height, which is kind of interesting, right? This particular screen, this uh, rows 4 through whatever, right, they contain basically the row height is 14.5. However, in our summary group, I want a little bit of an expanded group, right, because I want to show both the date and there in the same row. So I want these row heights to be set to 26, right? So I want the same... So the same rows, I just want the heights to change. So we can do that through VBA. So we know if it's the employee detail group, we want to set the row height to 26. Okay, so that's what. And also what I want to do is I want to show and hide certain columns. If we take a look and expand it, we see that we have columns AQ all the way through BZ or BY, BX actually visible, right? So I want to make sure that those are visible and that any columns before that are hidden automatically in that. So we want to make sure that columns F all the way through AQ are hidden. Okay, so we can do that through here. This line of code, we want to make sure F AP is hidden, right? That's only going to be used for the summary, whereas the AQ through BX, that hidden equals false. We want to show the summary, right? I want to show those columns, right? For our summary, these are the columns we're showing. Okay, great. So right, remember, if we were to unhide this, right-click and unhide it, is these ones that we're going to show. This is what I, these particular ones are the ones I want hidden. Okay, so that's how we do that through that. Right. So all we need to do is just hide it, and the macro is going to take care of the rest. Okay, great. So we want to make sure that the that the rows and the columns the columns are hidden appropriately or visible. I want to add the employee picture. Right. The employee picture is here. Right. I want to put the individual employee picture right here. So that means if I select any particular employee, if we take a look in a, in a different picture, Larry here, I want Larry's picture to show up right here. And I want it in, input it directly inside here. So this particular shape is called employee detail picture. I want to fill that picture with his particular picture. Now I have all the pictures stored on a folder, and that's right here located here. And I've got them in this folder. They're all located in this tracker employee folder. Okay, if we take a look at it, it is the same folder that's located right here, employee pick folder. This particular folder, of course, we can browse for that if we want to and locate that. This particular folder has a name called employee pick folder. This is the named range that I've assigned. Icons has a different name here. Oh, I didn't assign one to icons. Okay, no problem. Employee pick folder. So what I want to do is I want to take this folder and I want to take this particular picture name right here and I want to combine them for a full file path. But the only way to do that is to determine what row the employees. We know that picture's in column K, but we got to get the employee row. What row is that employee located? Well, it's going to be located in B16. If we take a look inside PHO Tracker here, and we look down here at B16, we say that we have an uh, employee database row located in row 14. We're going to use a match based on the employee ID located in B6. That employee ID is located right here in B6. When I select an employee, it is that particular ID. Remember, it's placed in here. And this is going to tell us what row. So if I know what row and I know what column, which is column K, then I can extract that picture. And I also combine it with this named range called employee picture folder. That will get us the full file path of that picture. Okay? So we can do that inside VBA. So the employee row is going to be extracted in a variable from B16. That is the database row for the employee path. We could then combine it for a full picture path, which is a string variable. We're going to add in that named range from the admin using the brackets. This is the picture folder. We're going to add a backslash onto that. And then we're going to combine what is all over in the employees, column K, and the employee row. This is going to give us the picture file path, picture file path. This is the full file path of that picture. OK, now that I've spelled it right, we are going to then check to make sure that it is an accurate picture path. We can do that using the directory command. Picture path, VB directory, does not equal empty, meaning it is a correct path. Then we're going to take that box that I showed you called employee detail picture. We're going to fill it. We're going to fill it with the user picture based on that path. That is going to fill that picture. And then we're just going to make sure that we've scrolled the right window. Active 
window scroll row. That's going to scroll up. That just keeps it from scrolling down. That means automatically going to scroll up automatically. Okay, great. So that's going to add in that picture when we click the detail. So that's all we have to do to basically show this detail. And the rest, what's going to happen here is we're going to then run the macro that's going to actually refresh all those shapes on the screen. And then we're going to turn application screen updating on. So that's the employee detail view. The next up is the employee summary view. Summary view is the one that we're going to run. When we click back, it is this summary view. First thing what I want to do, of course, we want to show this shape. We want to hide it. Basically, the opposite of what we've done. The summary group, we're going to make sure that that's visible. The detail group, we're going to make sure that that's hidden. I'm going to reset the row height for rows 3 to 14, setting them back to 14.5. And then also, we're going to take those columns. We're going to show columns F through AP using hidden equals false. And we're going to hide columns AQ through BX using uh, hidden equals true. We're going to, this time, we're going to run the macro that's going to refresh the summary. That is the macro that is actually going to refresh all of these shapes here and create these shapes. So that's the macro that will run automatically when we transition over from either one of the summary or detail or detail to summary. We want this refresh macro to run. Great. So now that we've gone over that, next up, after we've done the summary view, what I want to do is I want to do the select year. Notice we have this really cool transition where we can actually select on a specific year and show the detail within that year. Now, I've created just four shapes to do that, right? This little rectangle here is called PO year two. This is called PO year one. And this is called a previous rectangle, just rectangle and next. So what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to navigate and I want to be able to select a year. So when I select a year, I want it to turn blue with white font. Otherwise, it's going to be white with black font. Okay, so to do that, we're going to PTO select here. It is the same macro for either one of these, right? If I right click individual shapes and I click on the assigned macro, we see that the macro is called select year. It is the same macro for either one of those, right? So we don't need a separate macro for the individual years. It is actually the same macro. So this particular macro is going to let us know. Now we can differentiate between the year based on the value, the text that's in here. This text is 2022, and this text is 2021. So we can use that to our advantage. All right, so when we select the year, the first thing with POTO tracker, we're going to focus on that. The first thing what I want to do is focus on B1, which is our year. I want to put whatever year year is inside that. Whatever text is inside this shape, I want to put it directly inside B21. So when I select here, this is going to go to 2021. When I select here, it's going to go to 2022. To do that, I want to extract the text from that shape. That particular shape that we clicked is called application color, whatever, whatever that shape is. And I want to take whatever text there and I want to place it directly in B1. That's going to place the year. Now I want to take care of the coloring, right? I want to color it. Basically, we need to differentiate whether we're on year one or year two. Now here, what we're going to do is we're going to use the application color. So here, we're using the same shape, but here we're using the text inside the shape. And here we're using the name of the shape. So this is why I love working with shapes, because each shape can hold two data values. One, it can hold the text inside it. Two, we can use the name PTO year as another data value. So one shape, two data values. So here we can differentiate that if the application caller, meaning the name of the shape that called it, is PTO year one. Remember, here's the text inside the shape that called it. If it's year one, then what do I want to do? I want to color year one. I want to give it that blue color, right? So I want to give it the fill color. This is that blue. And here is this. This is actually the white the black font. And what we're going to do is we're going to fill the four color, the object, the theme colors, MSO theme color accent too. Now we're focused on the filling the four color, okay? So that's the background. What I want to do, I want to give it that blue background, okay? So here, when I select it, it's that blue background, okay? I also want to give it a white font, right? So the white font would be coming up next. This one, the same shape, the text frame, the text range, the font fill in the four color here is going to be just going to use the MSO theme color background one, which is that white. Okay, so what are we going to do with the other year? We certainly, the other year, if it's not year one, the other two, we want to color white, which is that background one, right? Giving that that white, but this time we're using that background as our background color and we're giving it a black font, which is the RGB, that font fill, that four color. 
RGB 000, that's the black font. So we're gonna call this the black font. We'll call this the white background, white back. And we'll call this the blue back. And then this is the white font, okay? So white font. Otherwise, well, what if it is not year one? What if it's year two? We're just simply gonna do the absolute opposite. We're going to give year two the blue background with the white font and year one, simply that white background with the black font. So we're just doing the opposite. Okay, now what I wanna do is I wanna differentiate between what mode we're in. Are we in the employee summary, right? Whether we're looking at the summary or whether we're employee detail, right? That basically what I want to do is when we select a year, right, we're using the same exact shape. The same shape here, we're gonna use both in the summary here and the detail here, notice we're using the same one, right? So I need to know which, when I select here, which one am I refreshing, right? Which one? So I need to know based on this, based on the shapes that are gonna be visible. PTO summary, if this is visible, then we should run the summary group, run that summary macro. Otherwise, we're gonna show the employee detail. And basically, when we select here, we just need to know which one are we running. All right, good, so we have that, and we're gonna go back, so that way the year will be automatically done. So we'll click on Fred Fetters, we got some data in there. So now I see what Fred did in year 21, what Fred did in year 2022. I mean, different macros, same shapes, based on what is visible. So we can use that to differentiate. Very, very helpful. Okay, great, so that is the year select. Okay, well, what about when we select a month? Now, notice that when we select a month, what I wanna do is I simply wanna change what's in B2, and then again, run, I, run the refresh. This, of course, our months are only located in our employee summary, so we don't have to worry about that. So. We've already placed here, so now again, I've just created these multiple shapes and I've given them a particular look. And I, of course, I wanna use a little bit of color differentiation so that we know that the selected month has bold and it's gonna be white to blue, whereas the unselected are starting at top of blue and then going down to white. So we need to color those accordingly. And I also need to take the month number and place it directly inside B2 and then running the macro to refresh. So to do that, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna extract the, again, we're gonna use application color. This time I'm gonna remove the, the string month and it's gonna leave us with the month number. So we can do that through here with the PTO tracker. That selected month, we're gonna put that into a variable. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the replace. I'm gonna use the application caller, the name, what is the name? And all we're gonna do is replace it. We're using the replace, we're gonna take, look for month, and we're gonna replace it with nothing. That will leave us with that selected month number. We can then take that selected num month number and put it inside B2. And then what I wanna do is I wanna focus on the coloring. So the best thing to do is take all of the months and then give them that light blue to white color, right? And then once I color everyone, including the selected one, then I wanna determine the selected one using, of course, our selected month number, and I wanna give that a bold color, and I wanna start that from white down to blue, okay? All right, so to do that, what we're going to be doing is we're gonna run a loop for the month number equals one to 12. Month number and the month number fill, we're gonna give that two color gradient, for horizontal one, and basically what this is going to do is just going to be that uh, light blue to white vertically, okay? And then I wanna make sure it's non-bold, non-bold, okay? So that's for every single one. So we're just gonna loop through that. And now all we need to do is focus on that single selected month. Because we've already put the month number inside a variable, we've saved it in a variable, we can then call that specific shape out. Month number and the selected month fill two color gradient, and this is that selected tab. Of course, what is that? Is that's white to blue, and then the bold font, right? Saying that bold font. Okay, so that's all we have to do. And again, we're only, this. these month numbers are only appearing on the summer refresh. So then we're gonna run the macro to refresh it. Because we've already placed the month number directly in here, and because we know these dates contain the selected month, it will automatically refresh, okay? So we'll get into that macro right now, but I wanted to make sure to go over the selected month. Okay, now we also have just a few more macros in this module, previous and next year. Previous and next year. Well, that's just a few lines of code and uh, basically it's just coloring so what i want to do is when i navigate to next year i want the selected year to be displayed in blue but notice we keep going there's no selected year i can use b20 b1 to determine what is the selected year so as we go back right 
if it's found that the selected year is the same, color it blue and white, right? And as we move it. So that's gonna give us this really cool navigation as we do that. So to do that, how are we going to do that? Well, the first thing what I want to do is when I go to previous year, I want to make sure that we can do B10 equals B10 minus one. And B11 also, I wanna set those years. Why is that important? Well, the first thing what we have to understand is the year here is relative, right? So instead of changing the text, we're gonna link it to a particular cell. If we see here that we have B10 and B11, B10 and B11, right? I didn't use B12, B13, we didn't need that. So this particular shape is connected to what's in B10. This particular shape is linked to what is located in B12. 11. So all I would have to do is just change these here using VBA here, and then it's automatically going to change inside that. So you notice how that changed automatically. So all we need to do is just change what is in B10 and B11. So that's exactly what we're doing here. When we go previous here, we're taking B10, whatever value is in B10, and we're subtracting one, and we're going to do the same thing in B11. When we do that, it automatically changes what the years are in the shapes associated. Now we can focus on the color. So we're going to set year one to unselected, right? If I do previous if i'm going previous i need of course the previous year here 20 is not going to be selected right so let's take a look at this for example if i'm on this when i go to previous i need to make sure that year one which is this one right here pto year one is that white with black font because it's not select okay so that's what we're going to do now setting the year going to give it that background color this is of course is the white background here white Let's just put white back okay and this is the black font so that's going to be for the year one we know that now but i want to check something else back black let's do black font okay so what i want to do is i want to know if year two is selected how do we know that if year two is selected? actually we can get rid of this one here we don't need that part right because that's already not we know that would be year for year one year two so what i want to do is i want to check year two if b1 equals what's in uh pto year two if it's the same meaning the the value the text value of this shape is the same as b1 then we need to color it basically what i'm looking at is 2022 the same here if they're matched then i'm going to color this the blue background with the white font so we can do that here if they're equal the blue background then of course give it that blue background give that shape that blue background blue back and give it that white font okay what if it's not then what I want to do is I want to make sure to give it that white background and the black font. So that's all we need to do here. So that just sets it up. So now that we've got that set up, that's the previous year. So that's just going to allow us to just go previous and next, next, previous and previous, next, next, so just like that. Very good. Actually, we did need this. I put that back in. I want to make sure just in case it was year two selected. And why is that? Because when I navigate here and I go back here, we're going back. We see that 2020 selected or we see that 2022 is selected. I want to make sure that when we go navigate next, it automatically moves to the first position. So that's why we had to add it there. Continuing on, the rest is relatively the same. The next year is same as the previous year, really. Exactly the same, just the opposite. But this time we're simply increasing the values of B10 and B11, right? Originally we were decreasing the values of B10 and B11, and now we're increasing the values, and that's going to automatically link it. So they're right here okay continuing on we're going to simply look if years already selected if not we're going to give it the colors and the associate just basically the opposite right all we're doing is exactly the opposite of that just checking to see if the years match and if they do match we're simply going to color it blue otherwise we're coloring it white that's all we need to do inside that macro it's almost the same okay very very good let's take a look now at the macro that's going to be the summary this is the macro that's going to automatically refresh that's going to create all these shapes and icons and the pictures and the employees that is called the summary and it is the macro that runs every time we select this every time we select a month or every time we also go back from if we're inside this right and we go back it is the same macro that's going to run each of those Times. So let's get into that macro right now. All right, let's go ahead and take a look inside this macro, and that's called the PTO summary macros. That's the module we're focused on. We've got some variables that we'll be going over as we move into it. First thing what we want to do is I want to clear all the employee IDs and of course the names, right? Now actually I do have the employee IDs also located here. If we take a look inside here in column G, we see that there's a nine. If we go down now, the pictures are covering it up, which is fine. We don't need to see that. But you see two, nine, two, one. As I scroll down, the employee IDs are located in column G. So keep that in mind. When I clear it out, the employee IDs are very helpful because when I select an employee, I want to place that ID and I want to put it in in B6. So we want to make sure that we do have those employee IDs located in column G and of course the name located in H. So when I clear them out, 
we're going to clear out all the way from G4 all the way down, clearing out the names and the IDs. So G4 through H. And I also want to clear out B7. B7 is our selected employee row. When I refresh it, I don't want to make sure any rows that's selected. That's the conditional formatting. I want to make sure that B7 is also cleared out. Continuing on, now that we have that cleared out, I also want to, if the view employee button, that is that, that is that icon that is located right here. If that is visible, I want that to be hidden as well. So we can hide that using visible equals MSO false. I also want to put the start date into a variable. Now that start date is called PTO or month start here. Month start is the first day of the month. That will help us determine number of days. It's located in I3. Remember that variable, that uh, formula here we had here, selected year, selected month. That is I3. That is the first day of the month. And I'll put that into a date variable called month start. Okay, now what we want to do is I want to remove all the associated shapes. Now all the employee pictures, all the icons, and all the PTO items. Basically, and that is this, all the pictures, anything that says employee pick or contains the text employee pick, I want that removed. Any particular shapes that start out with PTO item, I want them removed. And also the icons associated with any PTO, starting with PTO icon, I want those removed. So we're going to run a loop for every single PTO shape in the entire sheet, PTO shapes. If, of course, the name contains employee picture or the name contains icon or the name contains PTO item using the in string command, right? If they contain that, we're going to delete that shape. So every single one, we're going to delete the employee pictures, the icons, and the items associated. That's going to clear out all those shapes. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to get all the items from the admin sheet. Now we have those icons here. If you see these are three icons, then we can browse for those icons here. If we get to that, I'll show you what that is, or I can clear the icon out. But I want to take icon one, icon two, and icon three, and I want to copy them over, and I want to bring them right here, one, two, and three. Now we can hide these icons if we want to. We don't need them visible. But for our purposes today, they're going to be visible. So we're going to run a loop from the icon number, which is a long variable. We're going to run it one, two, three. Since we only have three dish, three icons and three statuses, that's all we need. It's sufficient. So what I want to do is I want to make sure that we actually have an icon there. To make sure of that, I want to see to make sure that there's a name located in K, right? K is the actual particular name. Now we can do two ways. There's actually two ways. We can browse this folder. We can combine this name and we can add the icon or we can just simply copy them once. So there's two different ways, right? Like this way is kind of better for, for our purposes training wise because, oh, we got a pop up color too. Because what I, all we need to do is just copy it. So that means when you get this file, as long as this icon is located in your file, you don't need to browse for it. You don't need to have any icon. So it's much easier. It's working better for you. So we've got the icons contained right here. Okay, but I want to make sure that we do have an icon in located in K to make sure that that is icon number in nine. So that means 10, 11, and 12, right? K, 10, and 11, 12. We're going to check. And what we're going to do is to making sure that there is a value there. If it is, we're going to copy the icon. The icon numbers are one, two, and three. So one, we're going to copy that. What we're going to do is we're going to then activate this sheet, PTO, making sure that it is activate. The reason we want to do that is we can't select anything unless the sheet is activated. So I'm going to select a particular cell. The cell I'm going to put it in is B19, B20, or B30, B21. We're going to put those in here by using the paste. That's going to paste that icon. And if we want to hide the icons, we can just do icon and icon number visible equals false. We'll, probably when I give you this, I'll make them false so that it's nice and easy. Then, And the reason we do is false is because when we hide those columns here, we don't want to necessarily see them, right? If I hide these columns now here, and I run that again, and I just, let's say, click the year here, moving that year over here, we see the icons here, Now I really don't want to see them there. However, if I decide to remove this and so that it's not longer commented out, and then I decide to refresh the macro simply by clicking the year or something, we can see that the macros are gone. So that's kind of helpful, but we can see that the icons are gone. So we're using that hide. And then remember, because we hid that, we have to move these over again, but I'll unhide them. For our purposes, we're going to keep column A and B unhidden, and we're also going to keep those icons unhidden. So we can comment this out. This will keep them hidden. Okay, so we've got everything set up there. What that's going to do is going to create a list of icons, create those three icons. Then all we need to do is simply duplicate these icons. When a travel type of PTO comes up, I can duplicate this one. When a sick PTO comes up, I can duplicate this one and this one. They're on the sheet already. Very helpful. Moving on, once we've created all the icons, then what we're going to do is we're going to load the employees up, right? I want to load it. 
And to, to do that, I want to load both the name and I also want to load the associated picture. And I also want to load them in alphabetical order. Okay, great. So to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to set that employee folder. It's going to be based on the admin screen. That named range that we've already set up inside the admin called employee folder. That is that folder where they're located right here. That is the name range employee picture folder. Once I have that inside a string variable, what I can do is I'm going to then use an advanced filter because I want those employees displayed and sorted, right? Determining with the employees, now we're going to focus on the employee sheet. What we're going to be doing is determining the last row of the employee sheet. We're going to run an advanced filter, actually just going to run without criteria, and then it's going to put those in a different location here, right? And then I can have both the ID, the name, and the picture, and then I can sort the list accordingly. And then it's nice. I've got the ID. I can bring this information, bring both the ID and the name over, and then I can run a loop from three all the way to the last results row and extract the picture, pull this picture from the folder, and place that picture directly located right inside column G. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Determine the last row based on column A. If it's less than four, that means we have no data. We can exit the sub out. Turn off application screen updating. We're going to run an advanced filter without criteria. Now, if there was also a criteria on this sheet, we would have to delete the criteria. There is no criteria on this sheet. We do not need to delete it. If we decide to add one, we will need to delete it. And what do I mean by that? When we run an advanced filter without any criteria, right, that we don't need, we would need to delete it existing if the sheet contains it. So let's say you're running two different advanced filters on the same sheet. One has criteria, one does not. Then what you'll need to do, in just in case you would, what we want to do here is just probably add an on air uh, resume next here on error go to zero and then what you want to do is just say dot names if you're on the employee and then do criteria dot delete okay so that's going to delete it so that just in case you want to do and then just do on error go to zero okay that way it's going to delete that named range if it exists in case you're using it because we don't have any criteria here and it's important to delete it when you don't have any great so what we're going to do is run that advanced filter from column a3 through k in the last row no criteria and we're going to have those results the employee both the employee ids and both the names and the pictures from column N through P, N through P, employee ID, name, and the picture. So that's going to put all this. And now what we've done is we've created, just simply brought them over, but I want them sorted based ascending based on the name here inside O3, okay? And also I created a named range, right? So name manager. If you take a look here, it's called employee names sorted, employee names sorted. And that's going to be using the dynamic offset here so that our results are always sorted. And that way, when I decide to add a new PTO, when I want to select a name, I can use the same named range here that's sorted. If we look inside the data, and then the data validation, we see it's the same named range. So that way we can use a sorted named range. Much easier to find employees and add them to PTOs when they're automatically sorted. Okay, so that's what we're going to do right now. So we're going to get our last results row based on column n. If it's less than three, that means we have no employees at all. If it's less than four, that means we only have a single employee, so there's no reason to sort it. We can skip the sort, which is going to go right down here. However, if there is more than one row, we certainly want to sort it. So the first thing we want to do is clear that sort, and then we add a key. That's 03. That key is that employee name right here, that first employee name. And we want to sort it ascending. So ascending is what we're going to sort. That range is going to include, of course, that employee ID located in column N, the name in column O, and, of course, the picture in column P. We're going to set that range up and apply the sort. That is going to sort the names alphabetically. Okay, so once they're sorted alphabetically, I want to take the employee ID and the name, and I want to just simply bring all those over directly inside columns G and E, right? If we move these pictures, we see we have the IDs right here. Okay, so I want to bring them from G and H. So G of our PTO tracker, G4 through H, and the last results row plus 1. Our results start in row 4 here. They start in row 3 here. So we need to compensate that by adding 1. Okay, so once we've done that, what we're going to be doing is we're going to then bring that information directly from N through O. Okay, so now that we have the IDs and we have the name, we just want to bring over the pictures. To bring over the pictures, all we have to do is just combine them with the folder. We've already put that into a name, which is that employee picture folder. Combine them to create a full file path. Now that file path was located at a picture file path. Okay, we're going to extract the employee ID into a variable as well. So that file path, the employee folder, plus the backslash, 
plus what is located in P as we loop through these individual ones, as we loop through the, we're gonna take that name what's in P and combine it to create that full file path. Once we have that full file path, what I wanna do is I wanna duplicate the sample. Now we have another sample here. If we take a look inside our PTO, if I, I think I put it over on the right here, I've got this particular shape right here. This is called employee picture sample. This sample is going to be duplicated and the employee is gonna add in automatically. Now let's just check for errors. If I decide to make an incorrect folder path, I still want it to refresh, but I wanna use that default picture. So let's double check to make sure that we have that default picture located or we're not going to show any I guess we could probably show the default picture or not any picture maybe we could do both so so basically if we decide we're going to duplicate it we could do that here so you see how it says if the directory path and then we're going to add we're going to duplicate it but what if I bring it right down here I duplicate it first right but I only let's do this let's do this I only add the picture in when we're filling it everything else is the same so basically what that's going to do is going to duplicate the shape it's going to place the shape with or without a picture right i like that better because it lets the user know that they can use the pictures so now because i've done this so now i just refresh it again here oops let's update that because we no longer need that so we can just remove that and if right because we have it already set up okay good so i like that so now what we can do is it's going to automatically show those shapes but it's not going to show the picture right which is what we probably want it shows the user that they have the potential to put in the pictures and the reason there is no picture is because we have an incorrect folder path as soon as i correct that path we want that default picture to actually change to an actual picture, okay? So as soon as I change it, it's gonna go back to the correct path. So what we did here is basically, before I would only duplicate the sample if there was a correct path, but now I'm only filling it with the actual picture if there's a correct path. So we're still gonna duplicate that sample here. We're still gonna place that sample in the right place, right? With the employee picture, we wanted the result row plus one. What does that mean, the result row plus one, right? If the result row is three, this is four. If the result row meaning the result row meaning here three four and five right this row this fifth one down i want to put it in row six here right here all right so we're going to be placing those pictures only though if the picture path is correct to check that we're going to use the directory command if it does not equal empty then we're going to fill that sample picture with the user picture otherwise we're simply going to use what the current value is and it is simply that default picture right here that default picture okay great next up i'm going to take this shape here this is our sample shape here it's located called pto sample shape it is this shape that i'm going to be duplicating to create these uh, particular pto shapes all right so that's what we get so now we've got the employee already done we're good to go now we're going to focus so all the employees are loaded in now we're going to focus on this pto database right so what i want to do is i want to load all of the pto shapes but only for specific dates right only for january of this year right january of this year that's the only dates that i want to do i want to make sure to see if there's any starting date or ending date now there's more additional if for example if we decide we're going to have a pto that starts on a different month and ends on a different month we need to compensate for that i'll be doing that inside our patreon platform so make sure you get added up on our patreon i'll be doing a lot of that plus i'll be taking your suggestions and that means if we're starting a trip on the the last of the end of the month and we want it to overlap into the next one i'm going to show you how to do that inside our patreon platform so make sure you join us there for that additional training and the updated workbook okay so we're going to focus on the pto workbook we're going to again we're going to run an advanced filter based on those dates we've got some criteria that are set up right here so we want the start date to be greater than or equal the selected year the selected month right it's got to be greater than that and i want the end date to be less than the end of the month right the end of the date to be less than the end of the month and we'll be updating this and i also want to make sure that we have a end of month date the end of the month of the selected year that start date must be less than the end of the month right or of course we want to make sure that the end date is greater than or equal to the selected month the selected year so that's just going to give us so that way it fits directly in it so those results are going to appear right here once we determine all those dates that are in january i want those results right here we're focused on the start date not necessarily the end date because i want to know what's starting inside there so that's why we've used the start date but the end date would help us to make sure that we have that already but primarily we can start with the start date and i want those results to come directly inside here so continuing on with the macro once we 
run that advanced filter from A3 through I, right, all the way through column I is where we're going to go, right? We don't need the workdays, right? That's not going to be important because workdays is going to be used for formulas, but really in this case, I really want to show the total days, right? So we're going to keep that and we're going to use our criteria from N2 all the way through O4. And the results are going to come directly from Q2 all the way through Y2. So that's exactly where we're going to have that. I want to check the last results row based in column Q. I want to see if we have any results. Of course, if it's less than three, then we can exit the sub, right? Because there's no date at all. Assuming that we have data, we can then move on, right? So continuing on here, right? What I want to do is I want to run a loop for the result row, a long variable, from three to the last results row. I want to extract a lot of information and put that into variables. The PTO ID is going to come from Q, the employee name in from column R, while the PTO name, the name of the PTO, that's important to put in the text, from column T, the type, right, that's going to help us with the color. We need that. That's going to be in column U. The start, we need to know what column to position that from W. And the number of days, how big should we, long should we make that shape? How wide should it be? And that's going to be coming from column X, okay? I also want to know the start column. What is the start column? What column are we starting it on, right? How do we know, right? If I know this particular PTO starts on the third, right, it's going to be starting in column K. How do we know that? Yeah. Well, basically, we know if this is column, if it's on January 1st, if this is column, let's take a look at this, 8, right? If this is column 8 and it starts on the January 1st, then I know that we can start our on the specific start column minus the start minus 8, right? So that means it's going to start on column 9 or plus 9. So what we need to do is the start date, let's say it starts on the 3rd, minus the month start. Right, minus, we're subtracting the start date, so the start of it. So if this is the third and this is the first, that is going to be two, right? The third minus the first is two, plus nine is going to be column 11. So that's going to put it directly inside column 11. So if we see here, we know that this third is going to start on column 11. Anything on the third is going to start on column 11. So I know column 11 is where we're going to first start that. Very important. We're going to put that inside a variable called start column. Okay, I also want to know what row, right? Now that we know what column to put it in, what row? We need to find the employee name. We need to look here and see which one, usually the employee ID or the name, either one would be okay. And so we're going to find that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look inside the employee ID because names can change, IDs won't. So what I want to extract that employee row, what we're going to do is we're going to look inside column G. Remember, I've placed that ID inside column G hidden by the picture. I want to look for that from starting from G4 all the way to down inside that. And what am I looking for inside that range? I'm looking for the employee ID. I'm looking in the values and hold on, I'm extracting the row. If it's not found, it could create an error. Therefore, I've wrapped an on and resume next and on and go to zero. If it is found, it's going to put that variable, that row inside the employee row. If it's equal to zero, we can we don't know we, we can't find the employee, so we can skip everything else. It's going to go all the way down here to the next PTO. However, if it is found, what we can do is determine that row, the PTO row here. Excuse me, the employee row. We've got it down, so we don't need to skip it. But what I want to know is the PTO row. What does that mean, the PTO row? Well, if I take a look here, I want to know what color to associate this. Is it blue? I also want to know what icon to associate with this. Is it found on row ten? row 11 or row 12, right? That PTO type is really important. So how are we going to know what row it is? We're going to extract it based on the PTO type. Now we've extracted the PTO type from column U here. It's from the database. So we know that vacation stick or personal, whatever it is, right? I want to look for that. I want to find it directly in here. I want to extract the row 9, 10, or 11 here. So excuse me, 10, 11, or 12 right there. All right. So what we want to do is, again, I want to look for it. So we can find it. That PTO row is basically based on the PTO type. We have named range called PTO type. If we look in the formulas and the name manager, and we scroll down here to PTO type, this one here, we see that it's in our admin screen right here, the PTO type right here. Those are all our PTO type, G10 through G12 in the admin right here. There it is. Okay, so G10. So we've got that right there. So that's going to look in that range, and I'm looking for what am I looking for? I'm looking for this PTO type right here. If it's found, we're going to extract the row. If it's not, it's going to create an error. Okay, so we're going to go. We should probably have one more on our resume next here. That's what I want. O and N. Okay, so that's auto hotkey that automates that. All right, so we're going to check if the PTO 
GL row is, is not zero, that means it was found. It's found in 10, 11, or 12. So I want to set the color, right? I need to know what color the shape is. Is it this color, this color, this color, right? Whatever the color is in column J and the found row is what the color is going to be. So we're going to put that inside a variable. So as long as the PTO is not uh, zero, we're going to say the PTO color is simply going to be the admin, column J, and the row, the interior color. Otherwise, we're going to set the PTO color to empty. Great. So now that we have the color, we can then duplicate that shape. We're ready to create the shapes for our PTO. And to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to take this sample one right here, and we're going to duplicate it. And this one's called PTO sample shape. We're going to duplicate that, and then we're going to position it accordingly. So the first thing we want to do is PTO tracker shapes, sample shape, duplicate, give it a unique name. We got the PTO ID, that's very important. We've already extracted it up here from column Q. So when we add that to PTO item and PTO ID, it's going to create a unique name for that shape. Once we've created a unique name, we can then work with it. So with that, we're going to set that left position based on that start column and the employee row. That's going to set at the left and that top position also based on that employee row, very important in the column. And we're going to set it just one position down. So it's going to put it just a little bit below. I also want to set the width, but how do I know with width? I want to set it the width based on the number of days, right? So I know it's going to be started on the 15th and it'll be gone to the 23rd. So I want to set it based on the number of days. So it's going to be the width of one column times the number of days to determine the width. So the width is simply the start that the width of the single column, this that width of one of the columns times the number of days, right? We've already extracted the days here from column X. So that is going to set the width of one column times the number of days. All right, so now we're ready to add the color. I want to color that shape accordingly. So as long as the color does not equal empty, we're going to fill the color. We're already st we're still within that shape. Fill for color RGB, and that's going to set the PT color. Set the shape color. Set shape color. Now that we have the shape color, what I want to do is I want to add the text inside that. Now what text are we going to add in? Well, the text that we're going to add in is going to be the text frame to text and the PO name, right? I want that name set up inside that. That's the name of whatever the PTO is, right? So whether it's a sick flu or Cancun trip or whatever we've put directly in and saved it, right, which is this PTO name, I want that to appear as a text. So we can use the text frame, text range to do that. So the text frame, text range, text equals the PTO name. That's going to set the name. That's everything. We've positioned it. We've given it a name. We've given it the right color. We're done with that. Now all we need to do is add in the icon. I want to add that icon in based on the row. Remember, if the row is 10, it's going to be icon 1. If it's 11, it's icon 2. And if the row is 12, it's icon 3. So we can use that because we've already got them. We've already duplicated those icons. And then we put them right here, icon 1, icon 2, and icon 3. So we can base it on that row. Okay, so as long as the PTO row means that it was found, doesn't equal zero, we're going to set that icon. What I want to do is I want to duplicate that. Now remember, I said PTO 10, right? 10 means one, right? That's the first one that's found, right? If I subtract, if I know it's on found on row 10, and I subtract nine, that's going to give us that icon name PTO 1, right? PTO 1, so that icon, icon 1 is what we want. So I'm going to duplicate that. Icon, so to get that number, the icon number is the row minus 9, 1, 2, or 3. So we're going to duplicate that. We're going to give it again a unique name called PTO icon. Notice that this has seven characters that we duplicated here, and we also have seven characters that we duplicated here. So that makes it easy to extract the ID regardless of what they, what they click on. So what we're going to do with that, we're going to focus on that. All we need to do is just place that once we've duplicated it and given a name. We're going to then work with it, giving it that left position based on the employee row and the column. And we're going to place on the, again, the top position based on the row and the column and given that top position. I want to make sure that it is visible in case we fit in it, and I want to assign a macro to it, and it's going to be called select PTO, that macro, right? If they select, that means we don't have to select macro to this one because it's already, right? I've already got a macro assigned to the sample. Because I've already got a macro assigned to the sample, when I duplicate it, that macro goes along with it. However, the icons do not have any macros because I duplicated that from here. I probably could assign them to here, but that's okay because I've used them here. I want to just assign them through VBA. So we can assign them the macro through VBA using on action. And it's a macro PTO select. That's the next macro we're going to go over. And that's the macro that means when we actually select something that we're going to select. We don't know if the user is going to select on the icon or if they're going to select on the shape, but we want to make sure that the result is exactly the same. Okay, so we've assigned the same macro.
Okay, that's it. And on error goes zero. And then we just simply loop through all the results until we create those shapes and the icons and update that. Okay, great. The next macro, as I mentioned, called PTO Select. That's the same macro that's been assigned to both the shape and it. It is that same macro that's also been assigned to this sample right here. So sorry if it's off the screen. You see a sign macro. It's the same macro that we've done here. And because regardless of the shape, all we need to do because we've given the same name here, right? These mean the same number of characters, right? Seven characters and then the PTO ID seven characters and the PTO ID. So if I remove the first seven characters, it's going to leave me with the PTO ID. So this, the macro is very simple. B3, that's where we want that PTO ID in, right? Once it goes in directly in here, it's going to generate that row inside B4. That row is going to be very helpful to load in the details. So B3 is simply equal to using the replace. We're extracting the name of the shape that called it. We're going to take the name. We're going to use replace. We're going to take the first seven characters using the left command. And we're going to replace it with nothing. And then all we need to do is just run the macro PTO load. That is the same macro that we went over right here. That's the same macro that we went originally PTO load. Remember, B4 can't be nothing. So that's all we need to do just to load in that. And that's going to automatically load it. Very, very simple. Okay, this we don't need, just some testing. All right, so that's it for the summary. Next up, we have the employee detail, right? That's the macro that we're going to run. Now, when I select here, as we remember, we're going to select and show that employee detail, the macro that's also going to fill those in, right? We've got something similar, but this is a little bit different because I want to load all of the employees, uh, PTOs for a single employee for an entire year. This is for an entire year, and I want them to load in here. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Again, we're going to run an advanced filter based on this, but it's slightly different. If we take a look over here, we have the employee detail criteria. This time it's for an entire year. So we've got start dates based on the selected year all the way up until the last day of the year, a start date within that year, and the end date, right? Making sure that we're within that year. That criteria is basically inside that year, right? So we want looking for a start date that's greater than or equal within the year, and it must be less than or equal to the last day of the year. And I also want looking for an end date that, of course, is less than or equal to the last day of the year and greater than or equal to the current year. Great. So now that we've got that, I want to take those results. And of course, with a specific employee ID, right? Making sure that we have based on only a single employee ba based on that selected employee ID located in B6. That's why it's so important uh, that we add that particular employee on B6 has to have that, right? Has to have that ID located right in B6. Very, very important here. So how does that happen? Well, that happens on selection change, right? When I make a selection change, that ID is going to change. We'll take a quick look at that, right? Since we haven't gone over that yet. And that's going to be based on the PTO tracker here. And it's going to be based on selection change. When a user, right, makes a selection change from H4 through H99, and we want to make sure that H contains a value, right? H is the employee name. I want to take whatever's in G and the selected row, and I want to place it directly inside B6. So that's what we're going to do right here. B6 is going to take on whatever's in G and the target row. And then also what I want to do is I want to then trigger that conditional formatting based on B7 in the target row target row is going to take on that, okay? And then what I want to do is I want to display that employee icon, right? I want that icon to be displayed right here. I want to be displayed in column I and then move it over to the left a little bit. So to do that, we're going to place that in column I. We're moving it over to the left, 15 pixels to the left and the top position and making sure that that employee button, visible button, is visible. Otherwise, we're going to, if the user selects on anything else, we want to make sure that that is hidden. So that means when I select on another cell, it's going to hide that. When I select on this, it's going to show it. Okay, so that we've done right here. This is what's going to hide it, but only if it is currently visible. All right, that's it for the selection change. Relatively simple on that. Let's continue on with the employee detail refresh. This is the macro that runs when we click here. It's going to display that detail on there. So we don't have any information. Let's choose an employee that has actually some details. So let's go back here and select on our favorite Fred. Fred's got to play a part in every training. Fred's got a lot of time off. He's lazy. So let's continue on here with Fred. Now we see that Fred has additional ones. So what we want to do is, again, we're going to first, just like we did in row, we'll move a little bit faster because so much is the same. We want to remove all the icons, all the employee pictures, and all the shapes, okay, just through this. Then what we're going to do is we're going to, again, add in all the icons. I want to put in all those three icons right here and just to make sure that they're all put 
put in here. I guess we're not showing them. They're, they're now invisible, right? I've now hidden them so you can't see them anymore using that. If we comment that out, they'll be visible. So we're adding those icons just as we did before. And again, we're going to run another advanced filter determining the last row, but this time our criteria is different, right? Our criteria is based on a, an entire year for a single employee. So our criteria is going to be AA2 all the way through AC4. That is our criteria. And our results are going to go into a different location, AE through AM. We want to make sure that we have results, AE, right? If determine the last, if it's less than three, that means there's no results, we would exit the sub. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to loop through all the results, just like we did before, getting, except in different columns, extracting the ID, extracting the name, the type, the start date, the number of days, the end date. I want the end date in this case, the right? PTO end. This is going to be AM, right? The end date. This should say end. Not going to be helpful. Okay, end date. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to, get, again, get the start column. How do we know the start column? Let's take a look inside here. I know that if it's going to end up on the 1st of January, it's going to be in this column. So 1, right? So if this is column, it's going to be column 45. So if this is column 45, if I add anything on the 1st, it's going to end up in, in 46. If it's on the 2nd, it's going to be 47. So 45 plus whatever the day is. So we can do that. So our star column is the day of the start date. We're here we're using the day command, right? Something we haven't used much. The day command plus the start date plus 45. So if this is one, we're just, so we're taking a date here and I'm extracting only the day, only the day of the month here, one, two, three, or whatever it is through 31. And then I'm adding the column, the first column, which is 46. So if it's 45 plus one, the first day of the month, it's going to be 46. I also want the month row. Now, again, we want the month. I'm going to use the month command, right? I know that January is on row three, February on row four, and so on and so forth. So if I can extract the month, which is one, right? If, if January, if the month is one, how do I know what row? I simply add the month number to two, and I get the row that's associated. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. We're going to take that start date, and we're going to extract the month number from using the month command. We're adding two. That's going to get us the row. That is the row that's selected on. And the first one's going to be the column. So now that we have the row and the column, we can place it. So now we can continue on. So now what I want to do, again, I want to determine the color. I need to know the PTO using the same find command on the type. That's going to determine the row. Again, 10, 11, or 12. If it's nothing, we're going to set the color just like we did before. Right, PTO tracker, we're going to duplicate the same shape we did before, exactly the same shape, same macro that's been tied to it. We're going to set the left position based on the month row and the start column. That will set the left position. We're going to set the top position also placed on the month row and the start column, the top plus 12, right? I want to move down a little bit more, right? That top position of that is going to be adding 12. Why is that? Because I want this. Notice that our, our cells are much larger, right? They're much wider, right? I don't want it to cover up the date. I want to place it down. So I'm going to go 12 pixels down. It's going to place it below the date. So now we can see both the date and we can see that above it. Okay, so we're putting a 12 column down. But I want to, want to set the width. Again, the width is simply the, the width of the column times the days, number of days. That's going to set the width of the column the same. Again, the color also the same based on the column. And the text is going to be based on the name. So very, very similar. Okay, now what we want to do is setting the icon. Again, same. We're duplicating. We're looking for that icon. Row 10 is going to be icon 1, 2, or 3, just subtracting the row, duplicating it, and then setting, of course, the left position based on the row and the column, setting the top position, plus 12 also, making sure that it is visible, and assigning a macro to it. That's it. That's all we have to do. We're going to set the scroll row to 1, setting it up, and to true, making sure that it's true. Okay, so now you see we actually have added this data in. So now we have these data visible. We have, we've already shown you that. But also what I want to do is I want to display these little columns here. This information is very, very important. I want to know what the remaining times is, the remaining vacation, the remaining sick, or the personal leave. And it's also got to be based on this, right? Based on whether we're carrying over on use from the previous year or not. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to do that with some formulas. But the first thing we need in formulas is going to need some good named ranges that are going to help us with those formulas. So I've created some named ranges here to help us with that. Now you see we have someone that is called PTO Workdays here. This one, remember, we, we understand the formula. 
that's going to come play in hand because I've got to know how many work days are associated with that, right? If I know they're taking a 10-day holiday, but only six of those days are, are, are work days and the other four are weekends, I need to make sure that we're deducting only six of those days. So that's where this is going to come in handy. PTO work days, very, very important. I also need to know the employee ID. That's important, right? The PTO employee ID because I need to know only for the selected employee. We're only focused on the single employee. So that's going to work in our favor. And I also want to know the status, right? We want to make sure that, it, that it, the status is approved. If it's any other status, if it's not approved, we certainly can't deduct. So we want to make sure that it is approved. So all those are very important for us to properly add up the number of, of uh, work days that they've taken and the number of holidays or paid time off that they're going to be calculating. So it's very important. Okay, so let's take a look. Now that we understand a little bit about these named ranges, we're going to go back in here. And in our PTO tracker, we've got a little summary that's going to help us with that. So the first thing what I want to do is I want to calculate the number of used, right? So how do we know how many we have used? Well, we can use the sum if for that, right? So the sum if. So again, we're going to total up we're focused on the work days. Remember, we only want to give the calculate the pay time off for work days, right? That's it. So not the total days, just the work days. So we're, that's what we're going to sum up. That's why it's very important. And of course, only for a specific employee. So the, we're going to use sum it based on the employee ID located in B6. Only for the selected employee ID located right here in B6. That's important. Also, what I want to do is I want to make sure that the start date PTO start date is greater than the current year, right? I want to know only those for the current year, right? Greater than, right? The start date must have been started in the current year. I want to know everything that started. So we're using the date command, the year of today, meaning the current year, January 1st. So that means the start date must be equal or greater than January 1st. And the start date must also be less than the current year, so less than the last day of the current year. So we can do that, calculate that using the date command, less than or equal, the year, of course, the current year, plus the last month, December, the last day, the 31st. So it has to follow this. I also want to know only those that have been approved. So the status must be approved, right? So I'll go, this is a named range here for status approved. And then also what I want to make sure is the PTO type is BZ24, right? Only for vacation, right? Here's vacation here. It's going to be based on G10. This is based on G11. This is based on G12. So only that. So the last one that you didn't miss was the one that's approved. So this status right here is given a name range called status approved. This is the only one. If it's been requested, I don't want to add it up. If it's been rejected, or if it needs to be modified, I don't want to add it up. I only want to add it up if it's been approved. So what that's going to do is going to calculate all of the work days, the pay time off the days for vacation for the selected employee, only for those that have been approved and only on the current year. And as long all I have to do is just simply drag that down because I've made sure this is an here we're using b6 this is fixed right absolute here we also want to make sure that the selected day here that status approved is not going to change because it's the name range so i can just simply drag that down and you see now we're going to be basing it directly on the personal leave so this is all the ones that i've used in the current year how do i know which ones have been unused in the previous year what i want to do is i want to add up the previous year and then i want to determine the remaining so let's look in the unused previous year first of all if if it's unused, what's the? If there's no difference. If if we say no to each one of these, right? Meaning we're not, we cannot carry anything over from the previous year. We just put no. Then we know that automatically it's going to be zero, right? Because there's nothing there. So if the admin H10 equals no, then put zero. H11 and H12, so zero. However. If we are calculating, if we are allowed to bring over those unused days from the previous year, then I wanted to determine how many were you, how many were allowed, seven, and how many were used. So if I'm going to basically say how many were unused, seven minus how many were used is going to do that, or whatever's here or here. So we can do that here. So however, if, it, if they are allowed, which is here, so if it's no, it's going to be zero, but if we are allowing to carry over, we're going to subtract admin to 10. This is the number that we're allowed to have, admin I10, right? Let's take a look back in here. I10 is right here, I10, I11, I12. So we're going to take this number and we're going to subtract how many you use. So if we use six and we're allowed seven, that means we're going to have one that can be carried over to the current year. So we're going to do that here. So Inside this, we're going to take that value that we're allowed. We're going to use, again, some ifs. We're going to base it on the uh, PTO workdays. We're going to base it on the uh, ID. We're going to base it on this ID, right, the employee ID. 
And then, but the start date's gonna be the previous year. So it has to be greater than or equal the date, the year, the current year, minus one. That's going to get us the previous year, January 1st. Okay, again, the start date must be less than the last day of the year. Again, the current year, minus one, because I want the previous year, December 31st. Status must be approved, and also it must be this particular PTO type, the vacation PTO in BZ4. Okay, so what that's going to do is simply sum up all the ones that the user used, and we're gonna subtract how many they were allowed. So this particular one has not used any vacation in the previous year, so they're carrying seven days over to the current year. They've used three in the current year, so they have the remaining 11. Now what we're going to be doing, we know that they've used it, right? So that means if they're allowed seven per year, seven per year, there's a total of 14, right? Seven per the previous year, and seven for the current year, a total of 14, right? So they've used three, a total of 14 available, so they have 11 remaining, right? So we need to double that. All right, so we just need to carry that down. So how do we determine how many are remaining, right? Well, what we want to do is we want to know how do we know if we're allowed to carry over from the previous year, we're gonna multiply this times two, 14 days, because we're allowed to use two years combined, right? So in this, if the admin admin right whatever's in sarah minus the pto right and so what we're going to do is we're going to take the current how many are allowed which is an admin i10 how many are allowed and we're going to subtract how many were used right so if we're allowed seven and we use three that's going to give us four if i take four right that, that we have remaining for this year and i add to whatever's in the previous year that's going to give us 11 and that's just what we did adding in cc4 it's going to get us 11 so we know that we have three that are used this year four that are available this year adding those four that are available to the seven previous is going to get us 11. so we just bring that down so this is going to give us all the numbers that we use again how many were used in the current year how many and notice in this case right we you unused we were allowed for the previous year we, we used all, we have four left over from the previous year. We've used 11 this year, so we have nothing left for that. All right, so what I want to do is I want to create those, and I want to create a nice little summary here. So I've got a little donut chart to help us with that. So if we take a look at the donut chart in this, and we see the data that's going to be based on, this is going to be based on the data. We've used three, and we have a remaining three three remaining 11 right so i want that 11 to show up here so we have that here so it's going to show us if we zoom in here to this donut chart we create a little mini donut chart for each one of those so we know we've got 11 remaining and three were used here we have zero remaining they've all been used up and here we have five remaining and we also have some summary text i want the summary text i want to know that the vacation Right, so if we see this here, this shape, this is just a rectangle shape, we've linked the text to the admin G10. And I've linked the text to G11 and linked this text to G11. I also have additional, two additional pieces of text on top of that. Now this text is linked to what we have over here. So we've got this, I zoomed in a little bit. So we've got this one right here. Now this one, I wanna know how many remaining. The remaining of the current year, what is the current year remaining of 2021? And then whatever's in CB4, which is 11, of how many we need to know i want to add in is it 14 or is it seven basically so if the admin equals yes then we're going to multiply it times two because it's two years of 14 otherwise we're just going to say one and what does that mean that means 11 of 14 so if i've taken this and i change this to no right so we're, we're not carrying over from the previous year we can see that now it's been changed right so now it's four of seven right so now it's four instead of seven instead of 14 it's seven because we're only allowed seven per year we're not allowed to carry it over so that's going to help us determine that and all we did so this is a text that's going to be linked and i've got another one for the previous year text notice i've got current year text and previous year text so that's here so here we have the current year text here and we have the previous year text here so this current year text is linked to cd4 this residual here is going to be located to ce4 so we're simply linking it to these cells so that we can have a summary so the previous year text is residual from the year and today minus one right so i want to know the previous year the year of today minus one meaning the previous year and whatever's in cc4 so the residual is going to give us what we have here remaining seven right previous year seven we've got seven available from the previous year so when we link these text boxes to this here and this we have a nice little uh, detail here remaining 2011 of 14 the residual from 2021 seven here and we just do the exact same thing for each one of the three 
relatively simple all as long as we get the right formulas and we get them um, you know it can get a little bit confusing because we're bringing it over from the prior year but a simple yes or no will let the user do that and of course we have just a little custom background on this just a, if i delete the background i'll include this background in our patreon if you want to add that background and it's just a background that we're using custom background before my voice goes out <laughs> And I'll make sure to include this background here so we can have a nice background automatically. All right, very, very cool. This has been a really amazing training and actually a very, very useful application for any business hiring employees wanting to keep track of their paid time off, wanting to keep track of their employees. And it's going to be really great. I hope you'll be able to actually create and customize it. Let me know what else you want to see on this. I'll put it on Patreon as long as I can with a given amount of time. I hope you enjoyed this training. In this training, we did learn a lot. We learned how to create two different types of schedules, both a employee detail, and we also learned how to create an employee summary for multiple employees with a single click month, a very, very cool uh, year navigation here and we learned how to add and create and update existing ptos thank you so much for your continued support i don't forget to subscribe to the channel comment below like this video and share it i do appreciate that we will see you very soon thanks again